So welcome everyone to the Exprag Wine Gatherings. Um, I'm very happy to see you, especially in these uh, scary times. So of course our thoughts are with the Ukrainians and we thought if there is anything you can think of uh, how we can help, you might uh, share it in the chat later. Um, the important thing I think right now is that we stay united and it's a good coincidence that uh, tonight we have one of the biggest role models when it comes to uh, creating communities. So this is also the purpose of our series. And we're very happy to have um, the Italian queen of experimental pragmatics tonight, Valentina Bambini. And I'll hand it over to Ira to introduce Valentina. Thank you. Um, well, I mean, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce Valentina who I remember when she was just this big, you know, early on in her career, I remember her walking around Lyon uh, at the conference that we were having there and really excited and, um, and uh, you know, having had, uh, I think a poster or a talk, I forget, but, but who knew that, uh, you know, 12, 13 years later, um, you know, she and, <clears throat> Uh, her group in uh, in Italy would create their own exprag.it. Um, for those of you who don't know, she's a, an associate professor uh, at the School of Advanced Studies in Pavia. Um, and she studied uh, at the Scuola Normale Superiore, um, where she got her degree in linguistics. Um, and she, as um, I had the privilege to hear her talk about her uh, herself, uh, recently, uh, she you know, she started out being very theoretical, and then she moved into experimental work, and now she's doing, I'd say, more clinical work. So she's got really um, the big, good roots uh, for doing experimental work, um, and a lot of it's been on metaphor, which I'm assuming is what we're going to hear about tonight. So with that, I'll pass you uh, Valentina. Thank you, Ira, for this uh, well, touching uh, introduction. Um, let me share my, uh, my screen, uh, see uh, if it works. Uh, that's always a bit tricky. Um, I should add before you start that if people have questions during the talk, to put it in the chat, because that'll make life easier for us later when we call on people. OK. You can see my screen? Yes, okay. I assume yes, okay. It, it looks it looks kind of big, like as if it's not in its... Uh, um, it might not be in the slideshow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's how it looks. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, you actually, when, oh, I see. It's because you put a line in the middle. Ah, uh, yeah, that's because I put, yeah, that's okay. a stylistic <laughs> choice. Okay. Okay, we'll never do it again. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ira uh, and Nicole for, for this invitation. It's, uh, it's a great uh, pleasure for me to, to share my uh, research finding with the XPRAG community. And uh, like Ira said, uh, I've been working uh, in mainly in two uh, fields, and one is uh, the brain basis, the neurocognitive basis of figurative language understanding, and the other one is uh, figurative language impairment, uh, and more broadly, uh, pragmatic impairment in clinical populations. And tonight, I will focus on this second uh, line of investigation, with the aim of showing uh, on the one end how pragmatics uh, can be uh, useful uh, for the study of language disorders. And on the other hand, how uh, clinical studies can also help uh, theorizing uh, and solving uh, theoretically relevant pragmatic issues. Um, I will start by defining uh, pragmatic impairment, uh, uh, which following Louisa Cummings uh, can be described as the various way in which an individual's use of language to achieve communicative purposes can be disrupted uh, 
while structural language skills are more or less preserved. This is very important. Normally, pragmatic impairment uh, is uh, identified in those cases where individuals are not aphasic, but their communication doesn't work uh, in, the, uh, in a proper fashion. Uh, and these impairment normally um, are characterized by a failure in comprehending non-literal language, but also a failure in contributing relevant utterances uh, to a conversational uh, exchange. Traditionally, this kind of problems were attributed to individual with uh, lesions to the right hemisphere. Uh, and that's because historically, the first observation of problems in language that were not uh, uh, that could not be classified as aphasic, uh, were described uh, in uh, uh, patients uh, uh, with uh, lesions to the right hemisphere. Uh, that was at the end of the 50s, beginning uh, of the 60s. Uh, of course, at that point, uh, Grice had not uh, given his William James lectures yet. So the way in which neurologists described this kind of impairment was as difficulties with abstract language or higher than ordinary uh, language. And this view that pragmatics is associated with right hemisphere and pragmatic impairment is associated with right hemisphere lesions became very popular over the 70s, 80s and 90s. And I remember when I was a PhD student uh, and I was reading the main book in uh, neuroscience, uh, which is the book by Candel and colleagues, uh, and that was the fourth edition, that there was a section titled The Right Cerebral Hemisphere is Important for Prosody and Pragmatics. But if we look at the fifth edition that was published in 2012, uh, 2000, yes, 2012, uh, the uh, title of that section changed and pragmatics disappeared from it and only prosody remained as associated with uh, the right hemisphere. So what happened in, uh, in those 10 years? Uh, well, basically two main uh, facts. And the first one is that pragmatics started to be uh, massively investigated with neuroimaging techniques which show that pragmatic tasks, pragmatic processing normally engages a bilateral network of activations in both hemispheres. And these are just two examples of this quite uh, extensive literature. This is a study that we did on uh, metaphor comprehension that highlighted bilateral activation. This is a study on irony comprehension by Spotorno and Ira uh, and colleagues, which also highlighted uh, bilateral, uh, bilateral activations. And the second fact is that it became known that difficulties with the pragmatics of language are observed not only in individuals with lesions to the right hemisphere, but also in a wide range of cl other clinical conditions. Uh, what you see here is the table of content of a book that Louisa Cummings published in 2017, and each chapter represented different clinical conditions where difficulties with pragmatics have been observed. And you see there's schizophrenia, traumatic brain injury, Alzheimer dementia, non-Alzheimer dementia, etc. There's even a more recent book that was published last year where she focused on pragmatic difficulties in underserved population. And so uh, the chapter here deals with Williams syndrome, Down syndrome, Tourette syndrome, sensory loss. These are all conditions uh, that, although not extensively described for it yet, uh, have been shown to uh, experience difficulties with pragmatics. So the last 10 years have really witnessed a, a change in perspective for what concern uh, the brain basis of pragmatics and pragmatic disorders. And if we want to contribute to this change in perspective to understand more about uh, pragmatic impairment, uh, what we need to start with is assessment. What we need to start with is having a test to assess pragmatic skills uh, in uh, uh, clinical populations. And when I started, at least for the Italian language, the situation uh, was not brilliant. There were very few tests, validated tests to assess pragmatic skills, and they had some flaws. For instance, most of them were meant for patients with lesions to the right hemisphere, so they could not be easily uh, adapted and used in other clinical conditions. So what we did, we constructed a test and we validated it to assess pragmatic skills in clinical populations. 
And it's a test uh, that is called APAX. APAX stands for Assessment of Pragmatic Abilities and Cognitive Substrates. And it's a test which assesses both the production of appropriate conversation, and this is based on a broad definition of pragmatics, which is very common in the clinical domain, but also the comprehension of implicit meanings, figurative language and humor, based on a more focused and Gratian inspired definition of pragmatics. In these slides, I summarized the study that we did on clinical populations by using the APAX. Uh, and so what is especially relevant here is the third column, where we reported the percentage of patients from our samples that were impaired in the global pragmatic scores that is derived from the APAX. And as you can see, it varies, but it's always quite relevant. And it's quite relevant also in clinical populations that normally were not considered in language studies, uh, like amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or multiple sclerosis or adult with dyslexia. Okay, so uh, definitely uh, pragmatics is something that is important to assess uh, in the uh, clinical uh, settings. But today I will focus on schizophrenia that as you can see from the table is the condition where uh, we observe the highest percentage of uh, impairment, 77%. Uh, Let me say a couple of words on schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a devastating uh, mental disorder that affects uh, uh, between 0.5 and 0.7 of the world's population. Uh, and it is characterized by a cohort of symptoms that include delusions, hallucination, apathy, emotional flattening, uh, but especially uh, it is characterized by cognitive impairment. So uh, individuals with schizophrenia have impairment in working memory, executive function, attention, etc. And more recently it became known that also social cognition is impaired in this population. And remarkably, these seems to be core features of the disease. They are quite resistant to pharmacological treatment. They are stable from, from onset. How about language? Language is not in this classic uh, table of description of the feature of schizophrenia. But actually, uh, it is well known that there are some language disturbances uh, in uh, schizophrenia. And they've been known since the first descriptions of the illness uh, by Emil Kreppeling or Eugen Bloiler more than 100 years ago. And they are also included uh, in the last uh, DSM, DSM-5, published in 2013. Um, what is the classic uh, way in which psychopathology described uh, language disturbances in schizophrenia? That generally, uh, this, these disturbances are described in terms of tangentiality and derailment of speech and in terms of concretism. By tangentiality, uh, clinicians mean a discourse uh, that goes off topic, it derails. And by concretism, they need a difficulty with abstract, uh, uh, with abstract concept. Uh, and here there is an example taken from the clinical literature that illustrates both features. Uh, so a patient would ask to explain what it means that gold goes in at any gate except heavens. And the patient answered, there's jewelry, there's platinum, they use it on your feet for filling, there's gold in churches, there's gold in the mosque areas like Lincoln's tomb. And so you, you can see both aspects uh, uh, here. But of course, this is the description of psychopathology. We can also try to describe these disturbances uh, uh, in a linguistic way from the point of view of linguistics. And I always cite this review by Covington and colleagues, uh, which tries to do precisely this, to offer the linguist view on language in schizophrenia. And if you do so, what happens is that pragmatics, this is taken from their paper, Pragmatics is the level of language that is most obviously disordered in schizophrenia. So I would like to illustrate this a bit more closely by giving you some details on the study that I mentioned in the global table earlier, where we observed that 77% of patients with schizophrenia perform below uh, the uh, normative uh, um, base uh, cutoff um, uh, established on the general population. 
um, in, this, in this study, we tested a sample of 47 individuals with schizophrenia and 35 controls with the APAX test. And here you can see the performance of the two groups uh, in each task that is included in the APAX. So patient perform worse than controls in all the tasks that were included in the APAX, but those tasks where the effect size were uh, uh, biggest, uh, biggest are the interview task, which is a semi-structure uh, interview where we assess the coherence uh, of speech, the narrative task, where we assess the understanding of implicit meanings uh, in, a, in a narrative test and figurative language understanding. And if you think about it, this is nothing but tangentiality and concretism as described in the classic uh, psychopathological uh, literature. But something that we did in this study was also to look at the relationship between pragmatic impairment and impairment in cognition and in social cognition. Like I said earlier, uh, pragmatic, uh, schizophrenia is uh, uh, characterized by cognitive impairment and sociocognitive impairment. Therefore, it, uh, it, is, uh, it represents a good test ground uh, to uh, uh, investigate the issue of the relationship between pragmatics and other skills, uh, which I don't go into the details now, but it's a largely debated issue. I mean, there are, there are uh, authors claiming that theory of mind uh, has a major role in pragmatics, author claiming that executive function has a major role in pragmatics. So we can try to see how schizophrenia can answer this kind of questions. And indeed the sample of patients that I mentioned was a not only with the APAX test, but also with uh, the box test for cognition and with a theory of mind task. And then we did a regression analysis uh, with uh, pragmatic scores at, as the outcome and theory of mind, cognition, and other demographic and clinical variables as predictors. And what it turned out is that there is a multiple interplay of factors that influence pragmatic skills. So there is uh, theory of mind, there is uh, general, the general cognitive profile, there's also IQ, but none of them can really fully explain the global picture. So what we concluded in that study is that pragmatic impairment is a core feature of schizophrenia because it affects a large percentage of patients, uh, even stable patients, like the one that we uh, tested. It affects different domains of pragmatics. It shows diffuse correlation with other cognitive uh, uh, domains, but no uh, overlap. What we did in another study was to focus a bit more on concretism. Uh, we wanted to uh, use uh, uh, insights uh, from pragmatic theorizing to explore concretism a bit more into the details. Uh, and we know, based on uh, theory, that figurative expressions are not always are not the same. Uh, uh, there are differences between them. Uh, and in particular, we focus on the difference between metaphors, expression like uh, my lawyer is a shark, um, that can be defined as loose uses of language with varying degrees of familiarity. They can be more or less novel that involve a conceptual shift idioms that are highly conventional strings of words, which, whose meaning is partly storing semantic memory. And proverbs, uh, which are a little bit like metaphor, because they are metaphor based, a little bit like idioms, because they are fixed and conventionalized, but they also have some special characteristics. So they normally convey well-known truths, social norms, uh, moral concepts. And these phenomena are accounted differently in relevance theory. Metaphor and idioms uh, are accounted for in terms of lexical adjustment, context-based lexical adjustment. So according to relevance theory, there are processes like conceptual broadening that are used to uh, uh, solve, uh, understand idioms, metaphor in a continuity view from literal to uh, more radical figure, radical figurative uses. So, while proverbs are accounted for in different terms. Uh, there's not a lot of theoretical literature on, on it, but in the Sperberta Wilson 1995 books, we can find some insight on proverbs, which are accounted for in a coic term, a little bit like irony, because when we utter a proverb, we echo something that could have been said based on social norms and moral concerns. 
And so we focus on this distinction and we wanted to see how this impacts impairment that patients have with figurative language. So we did a fine grain assessment by crossing two factors, the type of figurative language, idiom, metaphors, and proverbs, and the type of task. So patients were presented with this expression either in a multiple choice format, so they had to choose the um, option between three options, they had to choose the correct one that expresses the meaning of the figurative language item, or as a multiple, um, as a verbal explanation task, so they had to articulate the meaning of uh, these figurative expressions. And what we observed uh, is uh, what you see in the picture here, patients, uh, uh, light gray, perform worse than control, again, in all tasks, but there was a major drop in the verbal explanation of proverbs. So when they had to articulate the meaning of proverbs, their performance radically dropped. And this matches with the echoic account. Probably this extra level of representation uh, is what trigger uh, the, the greatest difficulty uh, that we observe here. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, driven by theoretical insight, we could show that concretism is a nuanced phenomenon and it's influenced by the type of figurative expression. In another study that we are finalizing now, uh, where Luca Bischetti is uh, the first author, we are farther zooming in into concretism and we are going to, we investigated uh, how different types of the same figurative expression, in this case, different types of metaphor uh, can affect concretism in schizophrenia. And we focus on the distinction between physical and mental metaphors. By physical metaphor, uh, the literature refers to those expressions that uh, require inferences about physical or behavioral aspects of the metaphor's topic, uh, something like some cooks are barrels. Uh, by mental metaphors, we refer to expressions that require inferences about mental aspects of the metaphor's topic, like some politicians are peacock, meaning that they are vain, so a mental, a psychological characteristics. And this distinction uh, proved to be relevant in a number of domains. There are developmental differences between physical and mental metaphors that were shown already in the 70s. There are differences in the involvement of theory of mind. Uh, mental metaphor trigger the involvement of theory of mind much more than physical metaphors. And there are also differences in the brain response to physical and uh, mental metaphor. How does this impact concretism in, uh, in patients? So we use the physical and mental metaphor task that we have created and used in a number of studies uh, uh, already. That includes 14 items, seven physical and seven mental metaphors that are balanced for uh, characteristics like familiarity and, and, and difficulty, but of course they differ in the preferred interpretation, physical versus me mental. And we presented this expression in a verbal explanation task. So uh, participants had to uh, articulate the meaning of this expression and we score them for accuracy, uh, meaning whether the, the answer uh, were uh, touching upon salient uh, characteristics of this metaphor and for interpretation, whether the interpretation was physical or mental. Now, uh, uh, patients uh, uh, perform worse than control inaccuracy uh, for both types of metaphor, which matches with the idea that there is an impairment in metaphor understanding. Mental metaphor were a bit difficulty, more difficult. Uh, you see them in orange in this graph, but this was both in patients and in control. So there was nothing special about mental metaphor in patients. But when we look at the interpretations that patients give, now we see something special about mental metaphors. When patients were presented with physical metaphors, like some cooks are barrels, uh, even when they gave wrong answers, these answers tended to remain physical. For instance, they drink wine. But they went, when they were presented with mental metaphors, like some politicians are peacock, uh, their answers were not mental. They tended to be concrete, physical. They have a huge, beautiful tail. They are hairy and things like that. And so you can see this in a, in a graph. So for physical metaphor, there was the same probability of offering a physical interpretation in patients and controls, while for mental metaphors, uh, there was a much lower probability of providing a mental answer in the schizophrenia group compared 
to the control group. So concretism is a nuanced phenomenon, not only because it depends on the type of figurative expression, but also within the same figurative expression, there might be differences. But how relevant is all this from the clinical point of view? I mean, it's interesting uh, to see that the echoic account of proverbs finds confirmation in uh, uh, patients' uh, uh, behavior, but how relevant is it for, uh, for patients' quality uh, of life? And this is a study that we published last year where we try to answer this question and we look at the impact of pragmatics on quality of life and everyday functioning. Uh, there's a great uh, deal of research on finding the best predictor of functioning uh, in uh, schizophrenia and nowadays the uh, shared model uh, is uh, this one, uh, where cognition is identified as a main predictor of daily functioning with the mediation effect of theory of mind. Where in this study, we show that if we add pragmatics to this model, the variance explained increases. And so pragmatics uh, is a relevant factor affecting uh, functioning and quality of life in the ind individual. And therefore, it is a relevant target for intervention and rehabilitation. And here comes the last study that I would like to mention today, which is a study that we published uh, one month ago, uh, was out on February uh, the 2nd. And it's a study where we uh, uh, try to uh, uh, restore and train and promote pragmatic skills uh, in schizophrenia. And I'm particularly proud of this because for me, creating a training program was quite a challenge. I mean, I'm used to create tasks uh, to assess uh, skills and comprehend pragmatic skills, uh, but training them is something else. And how did I do that? Uh, uh, well, we went back to, to theory, and we went back to, to Grice. And we created a Grice and inspired intervention program, um, which is called Pragmacom, um, which uses a series of narrative prompts where there are some communicative mismatches. So someone is violating the Grice and rules of conversation. And then we try to increase awareness of these violations, and we try to trigger reasoning about pragmatic rules of conversation uh, via uh, awareness on, of their, uh, the consequences of their violation. And I will give you an example of how these exercises, these narrative prompts are structured. Uh, so for instance, uh, we uh, present a, a story where there is a, a communicative mismatch like uh, a participant uttering, uh, the lawyer is a shark, and another one answering why he has no fin. So uh, the other participant has a literal understanding of, of the metaphor. And then we uh, try to trigger uh, the recognition of this communicative mismatch. And we try to teach the rule that could be applied to solve it. And finally, we uh, try to improve generalization by presenting other contexts in which the same expression is used. Uh, and we try to uh, stimulate the use of the metaphor in, uh, uh, in, other, uh, in other stories. So uh, the, the Pragmacom, we use the Pragmacom in a study with two groups. Uh, one was assigned to the pragmacom treatment, the other one was assigned to a control, active control treatment based on conversational activities. So patients were engaging conversation about newspaper article without an explicit focus on, on pragmatics. Uh, there were no differences um, between the two groups uh, in any uh, skill, not pragmatic skills, but also not cognitive skills or clinical aspects. Uh, both groups were engaged in 13 sessions of 40 minutes uh, each once a week. And the two groups were tested pre-training, post-training, and a three-month follow-up uh, for pragmatic skills with the APAX and with the physical and mental metaphor uh, task. For abstraction, which is uh, um, taken from uh, symptom scales used in schizophrenia, and for quality of life. And these are the effects that we observe. So, uh, in uh, what you see here is the performance of the pragmacon group in blue and the control group in uh, pink. 
a pulse training at a follow uh, up in the APAX test. And as you can see, the Pragmacon group performed better than the control group, both a pulse training and a follow up. So these benefits were durable in, uh, in time. We also got an improvement, both a pulse training and follow up in the physical and mental metaphor tasks. Uh, so they were better in understanding metaphors. Um, there was an improvement in abstraction at post-training, but this was not maintained at follow-up, probably because uh, all the, the control uh, training was uh, uh, sufficient to promote these skills too. So there was nothing specifically about the pragmacon for this. But what is especially important is that not a post-training, but a follow-up, we observe an improvement in quality of life in the Pragmacon group that was not there in the uh, um, uh, active control group, which means that after three months, patients could, uh, in a way, consolidate their gains in pragmatic skills uh, and their social relationship, their everyday uh, functioning benefited from, uh, from it. So this study is indicative of the malleability of pragmatic skills and of the fact that they can be uh, improved uh, in a durable fashion with an impact on quality of life, thanks to a theoretically grounded uh, uh, intervention uh, program. So to conclude, uh, I hope that this uh, survey of different studies that we did on pragmatics in schizophrenia uh, could illustrate that pragmatics is the key to gain a better description of the linguistic, communicative, but also cognitive profile of schizophrenia and other clinical conditions as well. Um, pragmatics is also key to shape intervention programs that can promote quality of life uh, in this population. But if we look at uh, the issue from the other perspective, schizophrenia is also a test ground for theoretical issues in, in pragmatics. For instance, for the issue about the role of theory of mind, that it's definitely uh, present, uh, but not exclusive uh, in this population, or for different uh, uh, theoretical accounts of figurative language understanding, because we can see how this distinction impact uh, the impairment uh, in this population. Uh, to conclude, I have three slides. Uh, the first one is to acknowledge uh, my collaborators. Uh, I will start for, from my closest collaborators, uh, Luca Bizzetti, a postdoc in my group, and Federico Frau, a PhD student in my group, but also Elisabetta Tonini, who now got her PhD, um, but she greatly contributed to the Pragmacom uh, training, and also the new entries, uh, Chiara Pompei and Biagio Scalingi, who just joined the group with a great project on uh, uh, metaphors of climate change and sustainable development that I hope I will be able to share uh, soon with you. And finally, uh, the uh, people in, in other uh, institutions, Giorgio Arcara from uh, the San Camillo Hospital in Venice, with whom we created the APAX test, and Marta Bosia and her collaborators, Giulia Agostoni, who are the psychiatrists we work with. They do not only uh, give availability of patients, but they really share the enthusiasm about this research program and their fundamental expertise. I mean, this kind of work cannot be done, uh, but in collaboration uh, with, uh, with clinicians. Second slide I have is uh, to invite uh, joint efforts and further collaborations. Um, we created the APAX test in Italian, but of course, cross-linguistic assessment uh, of pragmatic skills is, is key. Uh, this should be done in other languages, in other populations as well. So over the years, uh, uh, APAX grew, uh, and we now have a Flemish version, an Hebrew version that was published a um, couple of months ago by Nira Marshall, a Russian version in the pipeline, a French version with Nicolas Petit is uh, uh, taking care of, uh, of this, and also German version is in the pipeline, thanks to uh, Nicole and Judith Besenbeck. So I definitely invite you to get in contact if you want to develop other versions, you want to use this version, and this is true also for the other tools I mentioned, the PMM, the training, uh, we are definitely open to uh, uh, cross-linguistic uh, studies. Third and final and most important slides come to Extract 2022 in Pavia uh, next September. Um, this is a conference that we have already announced. It's the ninth uh, Extract International Conference that I'm organizing together with Filippo Domaneschi. 
uh, we have a stellar list of invited speakers, Nicole Gotzner, Stephen Levinson, Anna Papafrago, and Mark Pell. Uh, the call for paper was supposed to be out uh, last Monday, but we had some technical issues and we, it will be out tomorrow or on, on Monday uh, with a deadline in early April. So definitely uh, stay tuned, submit your best works. We have a lot of uh, submission options, pre-register poster, uh, and Xprag ET awards for the best young presentation. So come to this event in the for a post-pandemic uh, nice Xprag uh, meeting and reunion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Valentina. Thank you. Thank you and Christ for helping patients improve life. <laughs> so um, questions in the chat. Well, there's a question from Napoleon. Yeah. Hi, Napoleon. Hi, Valentina. Thank you so much for the presentation. I, I'm really glad I didn't miss this one. I might have missed it, but it's great I didn't. Um, and there's lots of things I'd like to comment and some questions. But I, I'll just ask um, a general one. I, I see people asking about the proverbs and the idioms. I won't ask anything about that. A general one about where you feel the direction of research is going in pragmatics and schizophrenia. Um, in terms of the field that I know, uh, uh, which is pragmatics in autism, you know, a lot of, there's been 30, 40 years of a perspective on it, which was, you know, what's wrong? What's wrong? What, what's non-typical? Um, you know, in terms of the phenomena, the pragmatic phenomena that autistic people could or couldn't succeed with, you know, implicatures, metaphor, irony, indirect speech, act, and then what's wrong in terms of the, the mechanistic reason why they're not doing it right? And more recently, people have started saying, okay, right, okay. Sure, it's interesting to know in which ways, you know, autistic pragmatics isn't the same as neurotypical, but what is the autistic pragmatic system? You know, shall we, you know, beyond just saying, well, they're not doing what the neurotypicals are doing in this and that, let's see, what are they doing? You know, what is the pragmatic system? In autism. And there's a few, very few studies going out now, which are no longer, so to speak, comparing the autistic pragmatic performance with the neurotypical, but they're just asking like the question of how to, how to describe the autistic pragmatic, uh, you know, what's the cooperative principle and maxims for autism? And there are cooperative principle and maxims for autism, but they just seem to be somewhat different. Um, is, do you feel the same? Is, is there a similar question going on in schizophrenia? Because a lot of the work, a lot of the vocabulary that's being used is, you know, deficiency here, deficit there, impairment here, impediment there. Is there a, a sense that beyond understanding how they fail to do the neurotypical metaphors or idioms or proverbs, let's understand what it is that they're doing? Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, point that you are raising. Um, no, uh, there, there's not a similar discussion in the field of pragmatics and schizophrenia for two reasons. First of all, there's uh, quite some literature on pragmatic problems uh, in schizophrenia that does not use the term pragmatics. So it's not uncommon to find a study on uh, discourse incoherence, uh, perhaps assessed with automatic tools uh, um, in schizophrenia without even one occurrence of the term pragmatics in the paper or something on impairment in figurative language understanding and no use of the term pragmatics in the paper. So uh, very often uh, discourse is just uh, consider upon the umbrella, under the umbrella of language, and a figurative language or humor and irony are considered under the umbrella of social cognition. So there, we are a step back in the field of uh, pragmatics and schizophrenia, because there's still the need of uh, let's say, uh, claiming clearly uh, uh, and, and telling, explaining clinicians that these things are pragmatics, okay? Uh, but apart from that, there's a deeper reason, uh, which is the fact that it's not a developmental condition. So in a developmental case, uh, you really can ask what kind of alternative system was developed in those cases, uh, in atypical populations. Uh, 
while in adult clinical population, uh, people normally assume that it's the uh, neurotypical system that gets damaged. Okay, and that's why you can start from a, a classic model of pragmatics uh, and 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 assume that there's something damaging it. Uh, you can assume that the, the maxim works as they work in the typical population and it, this system gets damaged. So I think that there are these two reasons why the field is, is different and does not have this kind of, uh, of discussion. And there is a lot of focus on, uh, um, let's say, what you can do automatically, basically. That's definitely where the field is going now in uh, language and schizophrenia and also pragmatics and schizophrenia. So, for instance, now we, we, we are trying to develop some uh, semi-automatic uh, account of language and pragmatics in, in schizophrenia with uh, Luca and, and Federico. We are trying to do so, but it's, of course, quite hard, but we'll see. Um, okay, we'll move on to a question from uh, Sunny Tang. Hi. Hi. Um, my, uh, my question is, is um, direct. Uh, were there practice effects uh, or were the, was that practice effects an issue um, in the clinical trial where, when you were looking at um, you know, the post-assessments uh, post and the follow-up? Yeah, uh, well, thanks for this important methodological point. Uh, uh, that's the reason why we had the control group uh, to rule out uh, practice effect. And so uh, uh, basically that's the main reason why you, we have a randomized control trial design with uh, an active control group. Uh, I would say that the improvement that we observe in the Pragmacom group is not due to practice effect because it was not there in the active control group. Uh, besides uh, also the tests that we used, uh, the APAX and the PMM uh, have been um, validated uh, for uh, practice effect and they seem to be uh, not sensitive to practice effect. So uh, there are methodological uh, um, ways to control for it and we did so. Okay, uh, next question from Petra. Hi, Valentina. Thanks for the rich and comprehensive um, presentation. A lot of food for thought. I would like to ask something about the proverb metaphor idiom study. Yeah. So how do you um, explain the task effect? So in the multiple choice task, they did very well on the, on the um, proverb. So that means they can comprehend it and have some kind of representation of them. But then in the um, description or narrative task, um, they didn't perform that well. So is it production or how do you explain that difference in yeah. terms of the task? Um, there are uh, um, a series of differences uh, between the multiple choice uh, task and the verbal explanation task. Verbal explanation task is more difficult because it taxes more on language in general, because you have to articulate, like you said, it's production. Uh, but it's also more taxing, according to the literature, in uh, social cognition involvement, uh, because you have to, in a way, tell the answer to someone else. And so there's uh, a higher involvement of sociocognitive processes. Um, there's a meta-analysis that we did, and this one, this one was on uh, actually the uh, autistic population, where we compare metaphor tasks uh, in the multiple choice format and in the verbal explanation task. And definitely the biggest differences between the two groups are observed uh, between the autistic group and the neurotypical groups uh, are observed when you use the verbal explanation task. So this seems to be consistent across different conditions. Probably uh, there it has to deal more with uh, the taxing on language and on other uh, skills, perhaps also executive function, because you have to articulate a quite complex response. Um, however, there are advantages in using the verbal explanation task. Uh, and the main one is that uh, it's the only way you have to be really sure of what they were interpreting. Uh, while with the other uh, implicit uh, task, you are less sure uh, of, uh, of this. 
So uh, definitely um, there are different reasons why verbal explanation is, uh, uh, is more taxing. But this was in interaction with the figurative type. So verbal explanation becomes especially difficult with, difficult with proverbs specifically. And that's uh, something triggered by proverbs, I guess. Thank you, Peter. We'll stay on the topic of uh, proverbs. Uh, Larry has a question. Yes, it's actually quite uh, related. Uh, I was wondering whether um, one difference between the metaphor and idiom ta uh, tasks and the, or rather the examples, uh, especially with the, uh, the explanation uh, task versus proverbs. And I believe that irony would be similar to proverbs in this respect, although it wasn't part of the study. Uh, in the case of uh, metaphor and idiom, uh, there's a, a more straightforward problem in interpretation. So my lawyer is a shark. As, as Grice pointed out, uh, the initial uh, reception of that is that it's a false statement. And the, the, the reasoning is it's so obviously false that that couldn't have been what was intended um, because there's a, a mismatch between the kinds of things that are sharks and the kinds of things that can be lawyers. And similarly, in Break the Ice, there's a referential failure. Uh, Grice didn't talk about that example, but you know, clearly if you uh, talk about breaking the ice in a context in which there's no ice or kicking the bucket in a context in which there's no bucket, there's a, a direct link to there being something wrong and uh, another kind of interpretation is needed. Whereas with the proverb, there is a literal interpretation which is perfectly coherent. It's just that at the discourse, at the higher level, it's not clear how, for instance, um, a leopard cannot change its, its spots is relevant to a discussion, say, of a, of a uh, say, the Taliban refusing to uh, modify the their, their you know, actions or uh, the early bird catches the worm or a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. I mean, all of those are true statements. And similarly, um, uh, ironic statements have a level of interpretation in which they're simply making a particular claim. And it takes a little bit of work to, through theory of mind, to figure out that something else must have been intended. And I would imagine that in the verbal explanation, that would also require a lot more work than to describe what goes wrong with breaking the ice and um, my lawyer is a shark on the literal level. So if that's right, then you, I would expect irony to pattern with proverbs as opposed to metaphors and idioms in uh, the kind of problems that they would cause for both schizophrenic patients and possibly from what I've read, autistic ones as well. Is there a question? Well, is that is that right? Is that your sense too of what would happen? Yes, would definitely. Yeah. Uh, definitely, I would expect the same. Uh, there's some literature on uh, uh, on irony uh, in uh, in schizophrenia. Uh, there, the literature reported impairment. Uh, there's not a comparison between, let's say, metaphor, figurative language like metaphor, idioms, and proverbs, and irony. Especially, there's no comparison between proverbs uh, and uh, uh, an irony. But I think it would be very interesting to uh, test whether uh, they group, they sort of pattern yeah. together, yeah. thanks yeah. to the echoic element or mm -hmm. these That's other right. elements that right. you that you mentioned. Right. Um, I'm not sure those are inconsistent explanations. It, it, they might kind of uh, converge on the same sort of distinction, both the the echoic or non echoic dimension and the you know, the, the, the sense in which what you're saying is perfectly coherent at a lower level, and it's only the higher level of motivation and theory of mind that you get this kind of clash. And Yeah, uh, perhaps, you know. perhaps we could try to answer this question by mm -hmm. adding a further condition, which is humor. We share yeah, sure, some sure. aspects uh, with irony, but it's not echoic. Right, and right. Uh, perhaps this could help discriminating between the echoic account and uh, what you mentioned. And we indeed, we are starting testing humor in schizophrenia. So perhaps we will do this. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from Mira and then Nozika. Uh, 
Um, hi, thanks a lot. And I raise my hat to you for crossing over to clinical, really. I was impressed. Uh, okay, so my question, I think, goes in the same direction, maybe, as Larry's and others. Uh, so we talk about pragmatics, but there's so many things that go under pragmatics. So the specific question I have is, is there a difference between so-called free inferencing, like in particularized conversational implicatures, where you say something and I somehow need to do something about it, mm -hmm. and things that are really the speaker um, indicated that there's some work to be done, okay? There's some implicit meanings to be accessed, like factive verbs, I don't know. Uh, do they take into account presuppositions, reference, uh, discourse markers, all these things that have, you know, sort of built-in non-literal meanings like discourse markers. So do they behave in the same pattern or are they each, you know, <laughs> everybody is different? Thank you for, for this question. Uh, there's literature on uh, almost all the phenomena you mentioned. Uh, there's literature on discourse markers in schizophrenia. Um, there's a study by an Hungarian group, uh, which show that uh, individuals with schizophrenia use less discourse markers compared to the uh, control group. Uh, there are studies on inference uh, in schizophrenia done outside the domain of pragmatics. Uh, so there are problems with inferencing in schizophrenia or in, in general. Uh, for instance, there are, uh, there's a, a well-known effect, which is a bias uh, against this confirmatory evidence. So when once they jump to a conclusion, they have difficulties updating this conclusion by making new inferences based on novel evidence that becomes available. Uh, so um, uh, to answer your question, I would say that these specific pragmatic domains that we as linguists are known and would list in a handbook of pragmatics sort of, uh, are generally impaired in, uh, uh, in schizophrenia. And uh, I think that there is an underlying uh, reason, which is an impairment in inferential processing, basically. I don't know if I answer your question, but from a, let's say, the point of view of the behavior, linguistic behavior that we can observe, uh, pragmatics is really obviously compromised in, uh, in schizophrenia. Uh, even the ICSIS is compromised in, in schizophrenia. Uh, so they perform worse than, uh, than the control group, um, despite the fact that structural language is usually preserved. I should be clearer on that. Uh, if you do a fine grain test of uh, syntactic uh, comprehension in uh, uh, schizophrenia, uh, and we did one with Andrea Moro uh, a few years ago, you will find that individuals with schizophrenia perform worse than control. But of course, this is a clinical condition. Also, their working memory is lower, their attention is lower, their skills are generally lower. But if you take, take a, an aphasia test where there is like you have to, uh, um, you know, pair the sentence, uh, the, the, the girl is kissing the boy, something very, very simple, very big. Well, this is not so, so simple. Like the, the, the girl is kicking the ball, something like that. And they have to pair the sentence and the picture. They would not perform as bad as individuals with aphasia. Okay. So uh, the structural language is, let's say, more or less preserved in this population. Uh, but the pragmatic domain is really very vulnerable. And I'm using an adjective that Ira doesn't particularly like, but I hope that what I mean is clear. And the pragmatic skills are really vulnerable in this, uh, in this condition. Uh, I hope I answer your question. Yeah, yeah, but can I have a short follow-up? Go for it. Okay, so some there are some uh, structure, I mean, lexical items, let's say, that really have a conventional meaning, even if it's so-called pragmatic in that it doesn't affect truth conditions, like but, okay? Mm -hmm. Like given this, uh, you know, Absolutely. old information yes. markers. Um, how do they do on those? Okay, so do, they, do these belong to the structural 
part or do they belong to the pragmatic? How do they pattern? That I, I would not know, but uh, also, I mean, conventional aspects uh, uh, when they have to deal with context a little bit are damaged. And I can mention a study that focused specifically on idioms, ambiguous and not ambiguous. Uh, and the ambiguous one are those that uh, can have a literal, plausible literal interpretation, uh, while the non-ambiguous one do not have a plausible literal interpretation. And so both are conventional, but the ambiguous one rely on context much more. Well, anyway, both types were impaired in schizophrenia. This is a study for Stottori Schettino. Uh, and uh, so I would guess that also conventional uh, uh, inferences that are attached to expression like but uh, can be, uh, can be uh, compromised in, in schizophrenia, but, of, but this I do not know. Of course, it should be tested. And to answer your question, whether it patterns more with structural language or with pragmatics, uh, uh, how frequent this impairment is, uh, um, if it's uh, as frequent as structural language impairment or as frequent as pragmatic impairment, that really would need to be uh, investigated. And notice that, I mean, it's not common to assess pragmatics in a clinical setting. So um, although there's literature, not, not as much as there is for autism, for instance. Okay, let's Thank move on much. to what will be our last question from Nozica. Hi. Uh, thanks. Hi, Nozica. Hi, Valentina. Thanks a lot. It was a beautiful talk and amazing data. Um, so I have a much more open question uh, about the intervention study. And... Um, I was actually quite impressed with this idea that you still found an effect three months later, and in particular, this effect on quality of life. So I really have uh, two two kind of small questions. One is is just uh, how exactly do you look at quality of life? I mean, I mean that questionnaire that you have, yeah. and the other one is um, is just generally how how do you in can you, can you imagine in the future that I suppose this effect would end up by tailoring off? So what, what, what could you suggest something that could be done? Uh, maybe um, a more long-term intervention or something like that? Yeah. Or did uh, you think about it at all? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, the, the test that we use, it's, the, it call, it's called quality of life scale. And it's uh, a bit of a hybrid test because it assesses both quality of life uh, and uh, daily functioning uh, from a subjective point of view. Uh, but there is some check from the clinician. And it's the, I would say, the most widely used test for functioning and quality of life used in uh, schizophrenia. And basically what it assesses is uh, interpersonal relationship uh, so there's a lot on, on social relationship, uh, but also um, personal autonomy. Um, so the ability to go buy, go grocery shopping on, on your own. And also um, the ability to have other function like to work, to have a job, uh, to take the bus. So this is what the, the scale is assessing. So really functioning, but also there are questions on the subjective uh, um, experience and, and subjective evaluation of the quality of life. Um, in, in, in the study of Agostoni 2012 that I mentioned, uh, where we found that pragmatics is a relevant predictor of quality of life, actually we found, and this is not surprising, that the subscale uh, of the quality of life scale on which the effect of pragmatic is especially relevant is the person, interpersonal relationship one. So it's important for, for communication and, and uh, for these aspects. But uh, in the training study, uh, we used the global score uh, to assess whether the training had an effect. And this was visible at three months follow up. And as you notice, I mean, it's not, uh, I mean, it's important, but uh, it's not enough. We should see whether this is maintained at six months follow up, for instance, uh, um, a one year follow up. And this has been done in the field of cognitive remediation, 
uh, where there's a lot of interest and investment. There's a lot of research on cognitive remediation, and I wish there could be similar investment on pragmatic remediation. Something that we could do to uh, promote this durability further, if I understood your question, is to have some boost sessions. Uh, so after uh, a, a certain number of weeks, uh, you do some uh, booster session to uh, uh, patients uh, with some pragmatic center uh, exercises. And this proved to be effective in other domains, and it might be in the field of pragmatics too, but we haven't done this yet. Wow, that was a great session, Valentina and, and questioners. Um, I'll pass the parole to Nicole. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So let's thank our speaker again for this wonderful session today. Thank you. Um, and we'll see you uh, in April, so mid next month. Um, our speaker is Daniela Matthews, who will talk about pragmatic development. And in the meantime, everyone, please stay healthy and safe. And we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for being here tonight. Bye-bye. Bye. Can I stop the recording? I, I have to stop it. Ciao, Ira. Ciao, Nicole.